everyone. I hope this has worked and you can all hear me. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. This, uh, this uh, session, I'm just making sure that everybody can hear me. Um, this session will focus on foreign direct investment and what approaches, tools, policies on the part of the public and private sector are needed to revive investment flows, in particular for sustainable investment. I think it's actually quite apt timing for this session at the end of this World Economic Forum edition, because I think what we will discuss today actually picks up many of the themes of, of the past few days, of the last week here at the virtual Davos. So just as a backdrop, last year, global foreign direct investment fell nearly 50% amid the global COVID pandemic, but also the buildup of regulatory and trade barriers. China, whose economic recovery has been kickstarted faster than the rest of the world, surpassed the United States as the number one recipient of foreign direct investment. Now, this dramatic fall in FDI has impacted developing economies in particular because of course they often rely on FDI as their largest source of external finance. And of course the fall has thwarted opportunities for sustainable growth, even as there has been a growing pool of sustainable capital that is looking for investment opportunities. So the aim of this panel uh, is twofold. First of all, uh, in the first part, we want to examine the hurdles to FDI that we have seen as a result of the pandemic, but also more structurally. And then in the second part, we want to propose possible solutions including whether there is support for new public-private partnerships that can emerge as the world's economies pull themselves out of the pandemic downturn. To tackle these issues, we have a distinguished panel from four different countries. Frank Ning, chairman of Chinese chemical company Sinochem. Welcome, chairman. Pascal oh. Kang, ambassador of France for international investment. investment. Welcome, ambassador. Ville Skinari, Minister for Development Cooperation and Trade for Finland. Welcome, Minister. And Alex Zwain, Chief Executive Officer of Global Innovation Fund UK. Now, just quickly, this session will be divided into two parts, with the first as a roundtable conversation with the panelists, and then a second part, which is a discussion open only to forum members and partners, which will discuss possible and hopefully detailed uh, solutions. And as a housekeeping note, when the first part of the session ends, those forum partners who are joining the second part and are on top link should just see automatically. My fellow panelists, for this first session, we're going to try to focus on the key hurdles to sustainable FDI. And I'd like you all to be as concise and specific as possible so that we can go through two or three couples of rounds in a full 22 minutes. Uh, that we have, um, but also so that we can go into the second session with some focused jumping off points. So first quick round robin for each of you on what you think the two biggest, let's say, challenges to boost in sustainable FDI, money, political, bureaucratic, Donald Trump. Uh, let's start with you, Chairman Ning. Uh, for investment from, from China, it's very obvious uh, regulations, political reasons, uh, and uh, approvals from other countries, and uh, and uh, uh, the Chinese investment uh, globally today, uh, particularly in a few uh, countries, are not welcomed. So uh, business uh, are keen and eager to grow and to invest, but uh, there are a lot of uh, 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 approval process. Uh, either it's uh, industrial or, or foreign investment policy, security, national security, everything. So that you, you, you can see is why the Chinese uh, uh, investment out of chi from China to other country uh, has been slowing down. So it's, it's very obvious today. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Kenyi. So essentially, um, I believe that uh, to rethink about FDI, you need to make sure that you first uh, protect or if not protect, maintain your own domestic economy. 
And that's why in France, uh, why we took the number one spot bay on EY of the most attractive country in Europe. We know very focused about uh, essentially ensuring that we go through that uh, crisis with the minimum damage and giving the means to both the states and the company to welcome these FDIs. Once this is stated, uh, it is clear also that any measure which is linked to protectionism, uh, any uh, measure which will be encouraging trade agreements will be critical. And we need you know, both parts, Europe, US and China essentially, to really realize that yes, there is um, a big journey of protectionism around the places. Uh, the states, the governments, the people, right? Wants to know more about what's happening. But in the meantime, our job, my job has been to explain to the French uh, people here that 10% of the total populations is directly linked to international investment, that they represent 20% of the R&D in France, 30% of our exports. So it's a good thing to have basically foreign investments to come here and to welcome them the best we can. So both addressing the issue that we have in our own economy and essentially continuing to be welcoming is critical. If we don't do that, we will fail and we lose wealth altogether. Okay, so the solution you're saying is lies inside as much as it is external coming in. It's a very good way to say that better and quicker, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Minister Skinari. Well, thank you so much. Uh, for me as a Minister of Trade and Development, of course, uh, the first main message is that it's so important that uh, trade and development go hand in hand because situation is very serious. Uh, the foreign direct investments, they have dropped by more than 40% in 2020 compared to 2019. And as we all know, in the economic recovery, FDIs will play a crucial role. And therefore, of course, my message is that private sector is a key. Uh, the official development assistance is, assistance is just a fraction of the global financial needs. And we can use development policy instruments to catalyze private investments. And therefore, of course, once again, uh, development and trade and the trade policy becomes so important to boost the investment. But I think at the end of the day, what we need now, we need a system level change. Otherwise we will not be able to tackle such challenges as climate change, and of course, the current COVID situation, the pandemic. Got it. And I want to come back to you on the second round. I'm going to press you on a couple of things you said. But um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I had somebody say to me, go to Alex. <laughs> Alex, I meant Dr. Swain, please. Uh, over to you. You have a uh, global uh, perspective. Your name is similar to mine, so it came automatically. <laughs> uh, you have a, a global perspective. Um, on this, what are, to your mind, the biggest hurdles? Thanks very much. Despite what you've mentioned about the decline in FDI over the past, in the very short run, I'll emphasize that in fact, the global pool of potential funds for sustainable finance is growing. It's prevented for a few structural reasons, like the minister said, from reaching the markets that need it most. Um, I think there's three big structural challenges that we could take on how we measure impact. And so we think about the risk return trade-offs we're willing to take, how we structure investment to manage risk in pursuit of social value, and how we combine and justify the combination of financially concessional and more commercial capital in blended transactions. I'll just say a couple of sentences about the first of these, measuring impact, because then other things about managing and tolerating risk and blending capital really flow from that. Let me give you one example from our investment portfolio. In 2016, we provided an early seed round of debt financing to a Ugandan company called Safe Boda, who were working to take the idea of a safer, more professional motorbike taxi service to scale. We exited that investment successfully in 2018 when Safe Boda raised an oversubscribed equity round with traditional commercial capital. Now, why was GIF willing to invest before other traditional capital was able to in this company? Well, at GIF, our mandate is to explicitly to invest in pursuit of social impact first 
with financial returns as a means to the end of scale. And by measuring these benefits, these social benefits rigorously, we can place a value on this impact and therefore price our investment differently than commercial investors can. We don't think just about lives touch or jobs created. We go deeper than that into thinking about our jobs productive, what other benefits are realized. In the case of that company, Safe Boda, we've modeled and estimated that 200 deaths due to motorcycle accidents have been prevented since our investment in that company. And there's something like $9 million in discounted net social benefits from the innovation, returning over $7 for every dollar that we invested in that company. If you measure those kinds of impacts with careful rigor, and colleagues like uh, the minister from Finland who are here give that mandate to development innovation partners, then we can structure investments to tolerate financial risk in pursuit of social value. We can think carefully about how to subsidize commercial capital to be crowded in earlier to these markets that are going to be suffering from a lack of FDI. We can really help capital get off of the sidelines and get into the game to drive recovery and get back all the gains that we've lost over the past year because of the cost of the pandemic. So thank you. And, and I, I want us to remember this issue over metrics uh, and, and sort of the more expansive view of, of, of metrics and this sort of investment. And clearly, though, your example cannot compare, and I'm going to come back to, uh, you know, the, the, the Chairman Ning, cannot compare to China, right? We are speaking about sort of small targeted investments versus, you know, China, which has become the, the number one destination for FDI. We're talking at bigger macro levels. So Chairman Ning, what, you know, why was this? What would you say the recipe to this sort of return increase of FDI was, especially against the backdrop of what, you know, we all know and have lived over the past few years of a, you know, commonly uh, called trade war, as it were. Alexandra, for, uh, for, for trade and investment, China uh, in recent years almost become the most open country in the whole world today. So China has been welcoming uh, free trade and uh, investment, FDI, uh, all the time. And then China is recovering uh, better, uh, faster than other countries. So that's why capital is still looking for their destination. Actually, even before, well before this uh, pandemic, even well before the trade war between China and the US, uh, investment in China has been kind of uh, from other countries, has been uh, you know, uh, uh, rebalancing or relocating itself to other uh, South East, Southeast Asian countries uh, for low cost reasons. And, uh, and but, but gradually, investment from other countries coming back because China is attracting more investment in a high-end sort of uh, 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 technology or um, open market uh, attraction to all, all this investment. So uh, it's, 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 uh, it's the market itself uh, provide a, a opportunity for companies to grow. It's very much a, a company-driven process. So uh, uh, China is the most, uh, 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 let's say, uh, fastest growing market in the whole world and a welcome investment, a company grow here. So uh, there's no restriction. Uh, so, I mean, all these things has been, it, it has been something the whole world is offering to investors. But today, China is offering more. But what would you say are the structural hurdles remaining then? Uh, I, I don't see too many uh, structural hurdles. I, I think it, it may be some, some still some, like foreign exchange, uh, in and out, uh, not 100% not free. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe some kind of uh, uh, areas, uh, 
China considers national security not open yet. Um, but for most of the business, most of the market has been open. Okay, um, and, and best of you can you. So your job, as you were saying before, is to make France, uh, you know, more attractive for investment. And clearly, France has some very important global companies in various sectors. So outward looking, but it also uh, has a reputation uh, for a country that protects uh, national champions when push comes to shove. So how does somebody in your position answer that? And then specifically, can you point to examples? that have been a success. And if you can keep in mind um, this concept of sort of the metrics that, that we, we, we don't need to always look at metrics in the same, you know, kind of financial prism, but that actually to get to the financial success, there may be other, uh, other um, uh, metrics that we need to look at, more social and socioeconomic metrics. Um, yes. So. Yes, my job is to basically uh, clearly get more human capital, uh, uh, money, finance to invest in my country, right? That's clearly the objective. And I'm sure that my colleague in Finland, right, uh, we all want the same. No, in the meantime, we define learning actually from China, which has been developing an amazing state capitalism, right? That maybe we need to be a little less naive over the years. Uh, and we also learned that against the amazing amount of uh, investment we got from the US. I just recall to your attention that one out of five dollars essentially invested in France, and I would say in, uh, in Europe, is coming from the US. Um, and we believe that the time has come for us to realize that if you haven't taken full benefit of the first or second phase of the digital revolutions, the one of the PC, the mobile, at the time where we talk about IA, at the time about we talk about cloud, we need to basically realize that into our 500 million inhabitant continent, right? Uh, there is an interest to, to basically protect this. Now you talk to someone which has been leading one of the GAFA. So I may be in a schizophrenic positions, but I also become aware of the absolute necessity to basically recognize that each territory has its own way of doing things. When you see what we're trying to do with the commission, the Digital Service Act, what has been done on the GDPR, which is essentially having a different stand high privacy, uh, what we're trying to do on the cloud with the Gaia initiatives. We believe that the time has come where we basically not close the, the frontier, but essentially explain that the rule of engagements need to change. And how they need to change? I mean, we need to have a doctrine where people are coming in, creating R&D, uh, setting up uh, operations, creating jobs, uh, poaching maybe the brain that we continue to educate through our own systems is all fine, as long as this is essentially allowing us to create the uh, required wealth uh, locally. And then, as uh, Dr. Swain mentioned, we believe that the time has come finally that we look at some much broader than life issues like the climate change. And that's why we have, using this COVID, the clear intention to build uh, the largest uh, decarbonated economy in Europe, in France and in Europe. So for that, better just to have statements on policy, we took some concrete measure. We essentially banned today any export subsidies to, uh, fuse, uh, to um, fossil, um, uh, fossil oils or energies. We essentially further developed the hydrogen by leveraging the debt. All of that to tell you that we are now in a world where we had kind of the glorious modernizations. We are so pleased to welcome back our friend of China over the last 30 years into the concert of his nations. Uh, we start from a lead positions. Now we are on the runner up, but the way we're going to engage will be different, less naive, better, better managed, and we will implement our own objectives. We believe that private uh, privacy is critical. We believe that we don't want to see the fire that California has gone through. We believe that we want to have a better balanced world. That's what we in Europe, I'm talking for Europe because I'm fundamentally an European, but that's what we want to do. And on that, it's not only us um, representative of politicians, it's essentially the people in the street. And you know that we are quite vocal in France in having this ability to express themselves. 
So we need to listen to them and basically play as what they want. So um, if I could come back to, to you, Minister, um, we had, uh, we, we talked before uh, about, you know, Chairman Ning talked about the market. Uh, Ambassador Kenyi talked, if you will, about the sort of ecosystem in a sense. Uh, but, you know, government, right? What, what can government do in terms of, you know, forcing the hand, in terms of removing bottlenecks, in terms of removing some of these structural impediments uh, in, in detail? What should governments do? Examples from yours and then exhortation for others. Well, Finland is a, is a good example uh, as a country. We were a poor country after the war and, and now we are one of the richest countries in the world because we have been encouraging people for education, research and development. And of course, we have been creating world level technologies and, and a green transition. But of course, for Finland, for European Union, it's so important that we really maintain and work on the uh, uh, rules-based world order. We have uh, WTO in, in crisis, but we see that trade agreements, trade and investment agreements have very important role because they provide stability, predictability for investors, and of course, I see that one promising initiative is the WTO's investment facilitation for development. But obviously, uh, we have to work on each and every element in these agreements. And of course, sustainable development, sustainable development chapters and the implementation is really the key. And of course, I'm very happy that United Nations, UN Global Compact, just to give you an example, with 12,000 companies in place, really engage and, and pave the way towards the sustainable development goals at the global level and really respect the 10 sustainable principles. Dr. Zwayne, where does the role of government end and the role of the private sector begin? Uh, who is the most responsible where? I think to answer this question in thinking about the least developed countries and where we want uh, financial flows to increase if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals and leave no one behind, is that the answer is a bit of both. And figuring out how to help both domestic resource mobilization be catalyzed for to accelerate investment as well as external flows is, is one of our big policy challenges. Um, we see that the DFIs, the development finance institutions of the Western countries in the OECD are increasing the size of their budgets and their role in bilateral aid. Um, but we haven't quite figured out how to create the right incentives for those DFIs to improve the quality of public service provision beyond traditional sectors like energy. Um, and I think that that's a great challenge for our DFIs to take on is to think about how they can accelerate and improve the quality of public services in sectors, not just in energy, but in water and in public health um, and even in agricultural extension so that you can see creative ways of blending capital to accelerate the quality of public service provision in the less developed countries. Well, just, just to, just a quick follow up, and then we'll do another lightning round. But you know, can you give us another example where you have seen this has worked uh, particularly well, uh, non-energy, obviously. Yeah, I'll give an example actually of a French company um, that's one of the uh, real stars in the Global Innovation Fund portfolio. The Global Innovation Fund, as some of you may know, is backed ourselves by bilateral aid, aid, aid resources. So the governments of the UK, the US, Sweden, Australia, and Canada use some of their aid budgets to capitalize the global 
Innovation Fund to invest um, to accelerate innovation in developing countries. So there's a company, a French company in our portfolio that works in Mali um, and contracts with utilities throughout French speaking West Africa um, to help them provide pay as you go water meters to poor households. So these are households that were previously um, denied service, probably because they most likely did not pay their bills to the utility. And now with the city taps, that's the name of this company, with their services provided to utilities, these households can be brought back into service and pay as they go for the water that they use. I love this example because it's not aid money working around the state. It's not helping an NGO to provide water services to these households in a way that's not sustainable. It's using an innovative approach, but that's been used elsewhere and many times as you go, to actually help the state do its job better and in a more sustainable way. I'd love to see more examples of this kind of investment in the portfolios of all of our DFIs. Great, that's a great example that gets to some a, a lot of the themes. Okay, we just have um, we just have a couple minutes before we have to break away for the second part of the conversation. And I guess just as a last thing, I'd like to ask you each just very pithily to say, in a moment when you know the global economy is still bleeding, when the hope of vaccines, um, you know, vaccinating the world is going more slowly than than we had hoped. Uh, and then when many countries developed, developing just across the world are really suffering. How do you kickstart this type of investment? What is the single most, sort of most important message that each of you would, would give in order to kickstart this? And this will give us a good bridge for the next part of the, uh, of the conversation. So just uh, a lightning round, we'll go the other way around maybe. Uh, Dr. Zwain first. Very pithily, we should capitalize financial vehicles that have the patience and the risk tolerance to support building back markets, not just selling into them. Great, okay, going back, Minister Skinari. Well, thank you. We need to build back better. We need to build back better and, and greener. And of course, then we have to catalyze investments great capacity, but also we need to scale up. But of course, we need the new normal way of doing it and, and we need to work it together. And of course, we need trust that the companies really can see open, stable and, and predictable markets. Ambassador, can you? Um, I think you know that typically in Europe, we've got a very high level of savings. I think we should basically break uh, the bank, get this money uh, refocus um, over innovation investment in a complete different way. We shouldn't tolerate that one out of fifth dollars is in savings, uh, serving only to create bubbles on the financial world on the real estate, but we should uh, dump it down into the innovative company that Dr. Swain was talking about on the new generations that we have here, which are finally willing to be entrepreneur, having learned from both China and the Silicon Valley and do something concrete with this money. That's the best things I can think of when I'm thinking about one measure. Great, and Chairman Ning. Yes, um, I think we basically uh, have to uh, understand uh, the world economy in the last few decades uh, have been built on free trade and uh, free investment globally. So I, I think uh, any other country, if you really want to kickstart your economy or resume or attract more foreign investment, you should treat foreign investment as good as your own domestic investment, even better, even more incentive. So I want to quote uh, the Tesla example in China. You know, Tesla built its uh, facility in Shanghai in a very short period with a lot of support from the government, even with the local finance and open market. 
and uh, compete against most of the smaller Chinese uh, electric car companies. They are very successful. So that's why China will be able to get more investment because investment in China uh, see a free market and a, and a growth potential. So I, the, the government policy is so crucial to treat uh, any foreign investment equally as your own domestic investors.